following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Remember this, when you're the greatest fighter in the world today, they got a name for you. They don't call you a great fighter, they call you Chael Sonnen. Beat me, if you can. And after tonight, none of you in this ring will ever You're talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kid stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine right, jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Woo! I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. And I have in my toes here. You have your cold beer? If not, you are fucking jabroni. Wash it down with one beer, two beers, three beers, a shot of whiskey. You become a motherfucker. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Martin, a phenomena that has never transpired before, the will rally again. This is your last goddamn chance to do something for humanity. All right, welcome to the Filthy FRB show. We're we're joined by a WWE Hall of Famer, uh, former uh, light junior heavyweight champion of the world, NWA. Uh, you might know him uh, in the late '90s on Monday Night Raw with Pat Patterson. His name is Jerry Briscoe. What's going on, Jerry? Well, I just uh, returned back from Orlando over the NXT Performance Center where we had a great tryout this weekend with uh, about a, a dozen Brazilians and Australians. It's very interesting. Great athletes. Yeah, uh, Jerry, I'm also joined by uh, filthy Tom Lawler, who's a, you know, is currently signed with the UFC and has some experience as a professional wrestler, too. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Tom's. He don't know that, but I've been a fan of his for for a while. So I'm I'm honored to be on both you guys. So of course I follow you on Twitter, Brian, and I always enjoy the controversy. Uh, you know, as the business I'm in, we're always in, in in some type of controversy. So it's good to have a fellow guy that can relate to what I'm able to uh, talk to. Yeah, and you know, I I often wonder like it rubs people the wrong way. You know, like I guess because I'm always you know looking for. You know, an honest, angle. honest, honesty, uh, Brian will rub people the wrong way. <laughs> what do you think, Tom? You, you think that'll? I, I think you're doing the right thing. I think both you guys are doing the right thing, uh, especially if you're looking for controversy. Because hey, Brian, it's only going to put more dollars in your pocket. So. Exactly, Tom. Well, that was a book, right? Controversy creates cash by Eric Bischoff. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I—I I don't know if you read it, but I did. Eric gave me a copy of it, and I really enjoyed it. Eric, Eric is a uh, Eric is a brilliant man. He really is. Uh, he's uh, misunderstood in a lot of ways, and a lot of ways, rightfully so, you know. But uh, he definitely knew how to create some controversy, and he did it. And they definitely made a lot of cash for not only himself, but for a lot of a lot of talent. That was a that was a great. <laughs> era for talent because there was competition and so when there's competition talent is the winner on it and talent and the fans are the winner yeah i mean especially during that you know the mid to late 90s i mean there were so many guys in the business making just incredible amounts of money and you know you've forgotten more about the business than i have but i mean was that the first time when guaranteed contracts Wait a minute, you're saying i've forgotten more about the business than you have forgotten about so no, that's saying i must not know very much to begin with uh, did, did i mess i messed up that uh i've already started drinking Coors Light, jerry i, I messed all up. right you know i wish i could join you <laughs> Uh, by the way, you do want me a beer. Tom, is he like that? Promise you a beer. Like uh, I was out to Vegas uh, for the Cliff Keen uh, Las Vegas Open. He said, I'll meet up 
we can have a beer. And uh, he conveniently waits until it's you know way too late or the tournament's going on. By the way, I'm at the bar if you want your beer. You know, <laughs> is he like that, Tom? Um, yeah. Is, is he got deep pockets and short arms? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had we had a good night that night, Jerry. You were too busy hanging out with the Godfather, Papa Shango. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, no offense, but. You know, I'd rather rather be <laughs> over there with a whole grain going on. And, uh... <laughs> now, Tom, have you ever ran into the Godfather in Vegas? Because I know you're you're out there right now. Uh, no, but I would actually I would stay far far away from him uh, just based on his days as comma the supreme fighting machine. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go anywhere yeah. anywhere near him unless I mean unless he's dressed up and he you know. Dressed up like the Godfather, he's got a, a bunch of women there. But uh, yeah, when I see a big scary guy with tattoos, I normally stay away. I tell you what, Tom. You know, uh, uh, I, I had a conversation with uh, with Charles one time. Everybody knows him, Charles White, right? Is his name, and uh, he, he asked, you know, you know, everybody's afraid of him because he's so big. Had all his, uh, had all the ink all over him, and I, he said, you know. Uh, why, why, why aren't you getting old with him? And I said, Charles, you're a good-looking guy. I mean, he really is. You look in his eyes, and he got those real kind eyes. It's, and it's just the way he is. He, he's really a good person. Nothing like the characters of Papa Shango's uh, the badasses and, and the uh, uh, roles that he played. He's, he's a real good down-to-earth guy. One of my favorite all-time people in the business. One of my, one of my friends. So, Jerry, I mean, for the some of the people that might not know about WWE, some of the MMA fans, what is your, like, official position with WWE at this point? Uh, basically, uh, uh, Brian, I'm a, I'm a collegiate talent scout, and uh, I cover wrestling uh, as my primary. Of course, of course, I'm an Oklahoma State kind of proud of Oklahoma State Cowboy. A little disappointed way I would get the bus at home last week, and uh, and expressed it. And uh, but uh, most of our good wrestlers, best wrestlers, are, are sitting in a, in a locker room with a red shirt on them. So, uh, so uh, you know, look, Cowboys will return. We've won 34 national championships more than Iowa and Iowa State combined. So uh, uh, we feel like we're ahead of the curve. Of course, Coach John Smith, uh, the greatest all-time uh, decorated uh, American uh, wrestler, both uh, collegiately and internationally. Uh, does a great job recruiting uh, nationwide uh, for for outstanding uh, uh, wrestlers. Sure. Now, Oklahoma State, they signed the top high school wrestler in the country last year, Chance Marsteller. And I haven't really gotten yeah. a chance to to watch too much this year. Do they still have the red shirt on him, or is well? That, yeah, that's what I mean. Most of the best wrestlers are, are sitting in, sitting in the dressing room with the red shirt on them. So you know, just waiting their time. And there we they they got some good big big boys too. I've a guy from uh, my hometown from Blackwell, Oklahoma, that should uh, develop. They're waiting for Marston to get out, which I think Marston was beat by Telford this week and uh, uh, a Marshall drink number four or five but I think uh, by the time the uh, Nationals roll around in St. Louis that he'll be seated up, up in the top two or three. Yeah, and I just want to, about Oklahoma State, I know 1964, your brother Jack came in second in the Nationals, and then 1965, he won the National Championship, and I don't think he was taken down one time the entire season, and he was a junior in 65. Did he come back to school in 66, or did he go pro? He uh, he went pro. Uh, he uh, was one of the first guys to, to start that trend. Uh, he had gotten married in college, married his, 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 his high school sweetheart, and they'd had a couple of kids. And uh, and uh, my mom, uh, God bless her so, uh, we had, we had, she had six kids, and uh, father deserted us, you know, typical story when we were young, and so she worked. And, but, uh, you know, Jack and I had scholarship, and uh, I had an older brother who was a basketball player that was All-American uh, by Murray State. Uh, back in the 50s and uh, put, uh, put us all through college, you know, and uh, 
And so, uh, but yeah, he he left, turned pro, uh, Leroy McGurk. And let me tell you, you got time, we got time to tell a story here. And Jack could actually uh, oh, yeah. tell a story about how he ended up at Oklahoma State because uh, he had signed a letter in intent with the great Bud Wilkinson, uh, the football coach, uh, you know, a living legend at the University of Oklahoma, the center. But then, and, then, uh, uh, and let me tell you a story. I had uh, football season, of course, uh, uh, runs over into wrestling season. So Jack, uh, Jack's senior year, they went to the state finals. Blackwell did, and um, lost in the state finals. And and so I was I was wrestling uh, uh, middle school at the time, and we'd gone over to a little town outside of Black Ponca City, and I won the tournament over there. I was real proud of myself. Uh, first really major tournament I'd, I'd won, you know, and I think I was in seventh grade. And so uh, I I come down our street, and like I said, you know, we didn't have a, a fancy neighborhood, but there's a big red Cadillac parked outside on the street in front of our house. And one who the hell's Cadillac? Cause, so I was excited. The coach let me out of the car, and I went running in. All of a sudden, as I went running in the door, I opened the door, and there stood Eddie Crowder, the uh, offensive coordinator for Bud Wilson, and Bud Wilson, the, the legend himself right there, and I dropped my trophy. Bud reached down, picked it up. Hey, son, what you got here? <laughs> Congratulations. I told him I won the trophy. He batted him on the head. I went on about my business, but he congratulated me. And, uh, and, you know, but uh, Jack was such a good football player that, that Eddie couldn't, Eddie Crowder couldn't close the deal, so he had to bring the, the head guy in, Bud Workison in, so Bud made a house call to my brother, and that's when Jack went ahead, you know, who's going to turn down Bud when he's in your house, especially my mom, my mom was in love with the guy, so uh, Jack signed a letter in tip. Myron Roderick, our wrestling coach at Oklahoma State, was such a smart guy. He'd gotten to know uh, uh, Jack and the family and knew that Jack was a huge professional wrestling fan. Danny Hodge you know, was was the local legend there. Uh, Danny grew up about 15 miles from where I lived. So the, the promoter in Oklahoma, Leroy McGurk, was an old cowboy, and two-time national champion at Oklahoma A&M at the time. So he called Leroy McGurk and asked Leroy if he would uh, give Jack a call and uh, and tell Jack that uh, when he got out of college there would be a spot that was uh, 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 I forgot I guess it was Oklahoma Championship Wrestling. So Leroy made the call over to Jack. Actually sent uh, Haystack Calhoun and uh, and another and, and another guy over. To, uh, to tell Jack, hey, Jack, you go to Oklahoma State, and there's a good job waiting for you when you get out of school. So Jack dropped the letter of intent for football and went ahead and signed for Oklahoma State. So that's how Jack and, and basically myself both ended up at Oklahoma State University, who was to Robert's you know, homework, doing it, that he knew that Jack liked wrestling, and the key to it was getting Jack a, a job afterward. But uh, then he was up upset with Leroy because after Jack's junior year to won the national championship, Jack decided it was time to move on and move, move pro and start making a living for his family. So that's what happened there. Hey, Tom, you were, were you going to hop in there? Uh, no, but I could. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, Jack I, and Tom. I, I, was just there's about a pre, I mean, there's about a million things that... Hey, uh, Sex Calhoun. Uh, Amazing. Happened there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Haystack was a remarkable person. I got to know him uh, very well. And when the Haystack you know, was one of those characters that didn't go into, we call them territories, didn't go into a territory and stay. He was like Andre the Giant is, it was during his day. He'd go in, you know, for like 10 days and get back in his car and uh, travel around and, and go to another territory for 10 days. But Haystack always drove those big internationals. You know how big those those vehicles were? They were the SUVs, you know, back in the 50s and 60s that everybody wanted. So, but Haystack was so big, seat and everything. So we had Bristol Brothers Body Shop, and they would bought a new one. They brought it over to the body shop. We had one of our body men. We had to re-bolt the seat. We, we undid them and drilled new holes and, and refitted the seats so they, they, they were custom fit for, uh, for 
uh, haystack, so he could, you know, get that big uh, growth of his in the car and drive comfortably. So he was quite a character. And for the people that don't know, I, I don't know that much about Haystacks Calhoun, but I've seen some pictures. He had to have been about 600 pounds. I mean, he that, was uh, they were advertised around 650, and he was ever bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jerry. So uh, he, can, he can move like a cat. Yes, sir, Tom. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan, uh, while we're on the topic of some of the, the old school wrestlers, I'm a big fan myself of, uh, you know, late 70s. Um, and 1980s uh, Japanese wrestling, and uh, I've come across a lot of your matches from all Japan uh, against you know not only Japanese stars there, but uh, the Funks and some of the other teams that were there. Can you talk a little bit about your experience over there in all Japan? Because we kind of see right now there's a little bit of a resurgence in the Japanese scene as far as interest, especially here on American soil. And uh, I was just wondering if we get a viewpoint from back in you know the 1970s when things were really going strong. Well, it was quite an experience uh, for me, and, 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 and Japan was a place that I dreamed of going. Uh, of course, a couple of my teammates, uh, Yojo Yutaki, who is, was a two-time Olympic champion, three-time uh, NCAA champion, twice, uh, twice outstanding wrestler. Back in our days, you could only wrestle for three years. You weren't eligible as a freshman. And Tadaki Hada, another one of my great friends. And so, uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about their culture from them. So I had the opportunity to go over. So I went over and uh, the first tour, I just posted a picture on Twitter of, of an old poster. I happened to go be going through some stuff for getting my, uh, starting to get my tax in order to take to my CPA. And I was digging through some files. I found this poster. I think it was from 1969. It was me, Funk, and uh, the Destroyer and had uh, uh, Tenru and Baba uh, uh, the pictures on there also representing the Japanese. So I, I just happened to take a picture of them posted on Twitter just last week, I believe it was. But if you, if those Japanese, if they, if they heard that you could go a little bit, and Tom, you know what I mean by that, you know, they, they would challenge you. And I was, I was on fresh out of school, 1968, so I was fresh out of Oklahoma State, so I was ready for any challenge they, they wanted to throw me. So they had some guys, they, they tested pretty good over there in the beginning. And back, I don't know if they still do that now, but back in those days, they, they tested, they wanted to see what, you, what, what you're carrying. So they found out. And I, I wasn't tested for too many nights, you know, after <laughs> like the first couple of nights. I, they didn't, my, I passed my test, I guess, to say. But it was an experience. And then I mentioned the Funk Brothers. A lot of people know that that Funk Briscoe rivalry was one of the most fierce, uh, well known rivalries of, of that era. And uh, we wrestled a bunch all over the world, Australia, Japan, Puerto Rico, up and down the Caribbean, all over the United States and Canada. And it was quite a contest. It, it was unique because the Briscoe were, you know, true brothers and, and the Funks were true brothers. So it was a, and it was that Oklahoma, Texas deal too, where, you know, an Oki can be the Texan every day of the week. You know, they said Texan can be. <laughs> Okay, the day of the week. So it was quite a contest, and they, they were, they were, we were, you know, we were allowed the time to go out and, and tell her story and show her skills. And I think that's what really helped that along because they didn't, they didn't limit it by time. You know, we go out, we go 45 minutes to an hour every night, you know, both individually as, you know, as a tag team. So, and it developed over the years and it stayed hot for years and years and years. So I'm really proud of that. That's one of the biggest rivals, of course, of them pass it along to, as we move along you know, to Steamboat and Youngblood when we captured the World Tag Team titles in North Carolina. You know, Jerry, that brings up, uh, reminds me about uh, the Funk Brothers. Now, from what I've read or what I heard, Dory Funk Sr. did some backroom politicking amongst the all the territories in the uh, NWA that postponed Jack's first reign as NWA world champion, that Dory Sr. maneuvered for him to drop the belt to Harley Race in Kansas City instead of to Jack in Houston, and he used some ridiculous story about, like, he got in a car accident or something. Is that... Is that well... 
Well, I, you know, I, you're going to have to if that's true. Uh, and, and I don't know if, if, if the accident was true. Uh, I, I, it's a conspiracy theory. You know, they always talk about the Montreal screw job and all that. But this was a conspiracy long before that. And uh, uh, it's never been proven one way or another. I mean, regardless of a fact, you know, it, it all worked out. And uh, Dory Funk Sr. was a very powerful man in the NWA. He had some real close allies with uh, Bob Geigel and, and that Kansas City group. So I wouldn't put anything past Dory Funk Sr. And I'm not saying if it's true or not. And I'm not going to say, you know, anything. Uh, but I just know it all worked out. And, uh, you know, Jack ended up getting the title from Harley Race. And uh, and Jack, like a true champion, when it came time, he was he was glad to, to pass the torch over to Terry. So uh, it all worked out. And, uh, you know, there's no problems. And we both highly respect both Terry and Dory Jr. And, uh, and I'm, I'm still very close friends. I mean, very close friends with both of them today. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that. Sure. Now, I, I mean, I, I heard that some people thought that, you know, Dory Sr. thought his son maybe losing to a legit badass like your brother Jack would make him look bad. And, you know, Jack had been going around to the, all the territories and he had been doing all the jobs. So basically he could set up. So when he returned to that territory as world champion, the pr local promoter could say, OK, well, our local guy beat him the last time. Now come out and spend your money to to see our local guy win the world championship. I, I mean, well, that's I'm one thing. very, I'm very impressed with your research, and you're right on the money for that. And that was a traditional way when, when, when you're getting a, a guy ready for, for uh, to win a, a title, you send him around to all the local territories, and, uh, and 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 you do the favor to build up the guy. That way, when you get the title, you know they have it on film where this guy beat you. But if Jack's title run was delayed by almost a year, so it kind of hurt. Jack in the long and the short run because uh, you know he, he'd been beat by all these guys, but uh, uh, it all worked out. And uh, but uh, that that was the way the system worked in and, and, and those days, and it was a very good system. And uh, Dory and, and and Terry and and Harley all did the same thing. So uh, they they go around and put the top guy in the territory over, and uh, you know, building for the title match. As soon as you got the title, you go in and and you had a ready made feud, and it was it was good business. And and uh, the old old school was was not a bad school. Sometimes you look back at old school and say that was terrible theory and ter terrible philosophy. But this wasn't. This is how you how you how you when he. Brought a check and he, it was ready made, but now you already had a ready made opponent. You didn't have to go in and spend a couple of weeks in there trying to make an opponent. You already had your opponent made. Sure. Yeah. Jerry, I think that's one of the reasons. Um, I know myself as a fellow wrestling fan, and a lot of the fans that are out there today are really, really impressed with the way that uh, NXT is run and the way um, that the development center is preparing, the performance center, excuse me, is prepare, preparing some of the athletes. Um, and obviously that's a system that you know a lot about, not only, um, you know, through your own experience, but also uh, your family's experience. And your son uh, was there uh, and went through, went through the rigors of the training system um, and then was also seen in TNA for a long time. Do you have a, an update on uh, what your son Wes is, is up to? Is he still involved in the business? Um, and how's that going for him? Yes, I do, but uh, let's just jump jump to the, the NXT. Uh, we we have a, a concentrated effort now to start recruiting uh, world class athletes. Uh, William Regal uh, uh, is assigned to the international uh, uh, recruiting, and he he just uh, uh, we had a crew in this weekend when I just returned home myself from from over at NXT, and uh, and it's a great facility. It's a huge facility. It has seven rings in it. It has a has a gym about the size of a of a I won't be a name dropper, but one any of the, the big national known chain gyms in it. We have a medical staff in there, a full time trainer, a doctor. We have of course all the editing rooms, film rooms where you can go 
go and study promo room for the great American Dream Dusty Rhodes teaches these guys how to how to uh, uh, cut promos and how to, how to uh, pay, for, pay for themselves. So we have a really concentrated effort of these Brazilians. There was a couple of Olympic kids we had there and a couple of Tom and, and Newfield now, a couple of LMA guys come up that uh, that is working to, to make the jump. And so... Um, and we had some Australian kids come up. So Riga went this this summer. He went to Australia. He went to uh, Brazil, and he went to India in search of talent, uh, athletic talent, not just talent, not just you know pro wrestling, you know, entertaining talent that that a world class athlete. So I'm really proud of that fact that that's 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 been our goal here recently, the last year or so, is to that's the reason I'm on the road all the time looking for these collegiate stars is to um, is to uh, to get better athletes in there. So in the future, uh, you'll see the uh, not saying that these guys now are great athletes because I, I overall from top to bottom, I think they're a better group of athletes than I've ever seen in the business anywhere uh, today as they have been at any time in my fifty some. Uh, years of being in the business, but my son Wes, uh, he uh, he uh, was a uh, 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 tag team champion with Xavier Woods when he was uh, over there, and he he's not the size of a lot of these guys, so he had an injury problem, and he tore two ACLs and, and a shoulder, and he was out for quite a while, and uh, it's a pro pro business. You, you know, if, you, if you're not bringing income in, you know, you're you're sitting on the shelf, and you're not contributing, and, uh, and like any organization, I don't care if football, basketball, hockey, or LMA, if you're sitting on the, on the shelf for a couple of years, you know, pretty soon, uh, and you receive, still receive and you check pretty soon uh, the uh, guy writing those checks and hey, hey I'm not getting my return out of this guy so it didn't work out for him there at that at that time uh, uh, doors still open for him but he wanted to explore so he went over to TNA and we all know during his time he got over really big as a part of that Aces and Nates group and was really the guy who stood out the most in, in that group uh, besides Bubba Dudley who you know, had like 20 more years experience in, but Wes was, was really the vocal part. He's a good looking kid. Uh, so, uh, you know, camera liked him. So, uh, camera was on him a lot, but he is extremely good talent. He's working around, working independence. I went out to dinner last night with him in Orlando. It was always good to see him, but, uh, he's still pursuing his career and, uh, he'll, he'll get a break when he does, uh, He'll shine. So uh, he's a Bristol. So he'll shine. So I got, I got a lot of confidence in him. Sure. Yeah, he's he's still a young guy too. So he is, you know, he's got his his time to make a mark. But I, I got to think as a. Uh, re- recruiting collegiate wrestlers, the performance center, it's got to be an incredible recruiting tool because now you can say, Hey, you can go to this world-class facility down in Orlando and it's not, Hey, you know, we're shipping you like Kurt Angle, I think went to Memphis. If Ohio. I'm not- okay. Ohio. 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 Well, he went to Memphis first and he went to Ohio. Okay. So I, I would think, uh, you know, when you're recruiting as a, uh, as a selling point, it's a lot easier to say to these blue chip athletes that you're talking to, hey, you're going to go to this facility that's on a par with the same facilities you were working out at at Oklahoma State or the University of Minnesota or Penn State or something like that. You're exactly right, and, and I do use I use that as, as a selling point, and I carry a, a little, you know, there's a, when we opened it up, we, of course, had the governor and senators and all that, and there a bunch of executives, and, and there's a video that, that shows a performance center, so I have that downloaded on my phone, so I said, this is just where you'll be, plus you'll be in Orlando, so when, I, when I'm selling these recruits, you're not going to an army or or, or, or an old warehouse to uh, to train in. It's a state of the art facility with with all the amenities that I mentioned earlier about the the training, the gymnasium. We have a physical trainer there that shows them how to work out and shows them how to gain weight. And uh, we have a nutritionist there that teaches them how to eat, so we can uh, 
control their their the style of the body and uh we do uh uh wellness tests there just like we do with our athletes on the road so uh and more so with these young guys where we don't want them to you know, at a younger age developing a bad habits so uh, it's a great selling tool and i'm very proud of it and the company's very proud of it, which they should they got a lot of money invested in it and that's a state-of-the-art facility and uh anybody that sees the wow you know what what way for this business to come a long way and i'm proud of it yeah jerry is there any tool that you use uh personally to keep the wrestlers away from the uh the public subs because whenever i'm in florida i have a really hard time <laughs> staying away from that substation at, at the public supermarket and uh I can only see how that would be a deterrent to uh, getting in shape. Well, uh, we uh, we work these guys so hard, Brian. I mean, I, and Tom, uh, these guys, it, it's, a, it's a six, seven day a week job. And we want them to relax and have fun, too. But we want them to act mature and be mature. If we hear any... Uh, Unappropriate behavior at all for many of them. They get a uh, build them on, as everybody knows, from tough enough. Uh, they get a stern set down from uh, from Bill. And uh, if it's any of my guys, all he's got to do is say, "Hey, uh, you want me to call Mr. Briscoe?" And of course, I put the fear fear of God in them, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, they all uh, all the coaches tell tell me, "You're a great, you're a great help." He said whether you know it or not, all we got to do is say, hey, we're going to call Mr. Briscoe. If you don't step it up. And uh, they don't, none of them want to get a call from me, believe me. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's because, you know, you showed a lot of faith in them to bring them into the fold. And maybe they, they look at you as almost like a father figure that they, they just don't want to disappoint you. Well, they, and I, uh, you know, I appreciate that. And, and that, that's what I'm told. And, and, and I, I'm glad I've earned their respect. You know, I've given them an opportunity to to be a, a mega worldwide global superstar, and given them the opportunity to to make uh, one heck of a living. You know, for for quite a while. So they don't want to disappoint me. Uh, uh, they, but I really go out and uh, I do a lot of research when I recruit these guys. You know, I talk. I got great relationships with, with uh, most of the coaches and, and they trust me. And I, when I go to one of these events, I always ask the coach, when is the proper time to talk to When do you want, want me to talk to you guys? You know, you want now you want me to wait till the end of the season. If, if, if you want me to wait till the end of the season, would you at least tell them that there's some interest in them? And, uh, and I get great cooperation from the coaches because they, I, I respect what their wishes are. And, and, and I don't, I don't, try to break an athlete's focus uh, when I go into a, uh, a facility to try to recruit them. And uh, most of them uh, remember the name Briscoe here from there, my brother, so or uh, from one of the coaches. And my friend Bobby H- uh, Douglas and, and Tadaki Hyde and Leroy Smith from the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. And uh, I've become very good friends with Kerry McCulloch, University of Maryland, who's a highly respected uh, coach, uh, and uh, he's recommended a few guys to me. And so I I, I, I think I've built a, a strong reputation, so I, I kind of very careful on when I approach these guys and how I approach them. And I feel bad, you know, I was out in Vegas and I saw this one kid and I just hadn't talked to him because he such a big uh, big uh, facility and so many teams out there, I was afraid I'd lose contact uh, contact attack with him. So I, I went up to him, he was getting ready, he said, You don't mind could we talk? I said, Oh man, I'm so sorry. I felt and I felt bad for like an hour, you know, and he went out but he won his match, you know, so uh, but I was told he would Jay Robinson who Jay and I were he Jay's a coach at the University of Minnesota, he and I were in the same recruiting class at, at Oklahoma State uh, together, so he was Brock Lesnar's coach, so I, I spotted Brock as a junior in college, and uh, and, I, and, I, and Jay said, please don't say a word to him, because Brock's one of these guys that that, that, that's got to have 100% focus, and uh, as we see how many jumps that Brock's made back and forth from uh, UFC to WWE and drag football and everything, 
everything that Jay told me about him was true. So I waited, and Jay said, I'll give you my word. If you don't say anything to him, as soon as he wins the national championship, and he would win a national championship next year, he said, I'll have him in my office the following week. I'll give you a call, and you guys can talk, and you tell him whatever you want to tell him, and talk him in and do whatever you want to do. So I waited, and Jay kept his word the very next week. Uh, I got a phone call from Jay. He said, I got Brock here in my office. I said, I also have Sheldon Benjamin sitting here with him. He said, I want you to take him as a package deal. So uh, we had, we just happened to have a, a pay-per-view coming up in uh, Minneapolis a uh, uh, couple of weeks after that phone call. So I set up a meeting. And uh, Was that what, so when Brock, Jesse Ventura was the referee? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. And so... And I said, then I, and I, I'll tell you a story on that to you, but later. But uh, anyway, uh, Brock Lesnar, Brock Brock, and Zeldin, and, and Brian, Vince McMahon saw Brock standing over in the corner talking with me. The first time I've ever seen this happen in 30 years with Vince. Vince saw the guy and deterred where he was going and actually came over and entertained and uh, walked up to Brock, introduced himself, which he doesn't usually do, looked at Brock. And he said, hey, you ready to be an entertainer? And Brock looked him square in the eyes. He said, that's what I've always wanted to be. I said, I said I Ben Clark Reynolds, Brock Evans is a perfect answer. He couldn't have given me a better of an answer, you know. And uh, and uh, and uh, so I was told, whatever it takes, let's get this guy in our camps and get him going. And we did. I mean, I, I've never spoken to Brock. Uh, I know some people that do know him, and he, he just gives off this vibe. It's just like a very, you know, scary person, like even in like a, a, a shoot, you know, like he's just very intimidating. Is there a, like a nice side of Brock Lesnar if, if you get to know him, or is he always just kind of like what we think he is? If you, if Brock Lesnar in public is, is the most intimidating person I have ever met in my life, and, and I've been in this business since 1968, so and I, I have you know friends that are pro football players and been around pro football teams and things like that, and I, and I have never in my entire life met a more intimidating looking person in public, but you get Brock in his element, you get Brock away from the spotlights, away from the public. Brock is one of the nicest, you'll probably kill me for saying that, but he's one of the nicest guys there is. And, uh, and there's one lady that can, with her thumb, can get Brock settled down in a flash, you know, a common story, you know, when Brock was ready to leave, uh, in the beginning, uh, she was the one that came to me and said, you know, you need to talk to Brock. He's ready to walk now. So Brock and I went up to the top of, of the Coliseum in uh, Georgia and sat there. We talked for about an hour and a half, and and I talked him into going and talking with, uh, to have a conversation with Vince. And then and, and, uh, and Vince and I had a conversation, and we worked it out where Brock could stay and, you know, finish his, finish his uh, contract, his run there. And, uh, but, yeah, Brock and Brock, you know, when you get him in his element, and all Brock really wants to do is be out in the country and hunt and fish and be on his farm. That's all he wants to do. He don't, he don't care about spotlights. He don't care about anything else. If Brock had, had, had a dollar in his pocket and had a truckload of ammunition and his, and his rifles where he could get a, a truck where he could go hunting every day, he'd be the happiest man in the world with that buck in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, I remember, Jerry, that Brock, uh, even young in his career, had a ton of hype around him, um, you know, based just on his look and his ability in the ring, obviously. Um, and I, with this this new class of people that NXT has, uh, I was wondering how much of a role you played in getting uh, Sonny Dinsa to uh, join the WWE because uh, he was looked at as a real Olympic hopeful for Canada, and he's done great things on the mat. And um, I was wondering if you know you see any parallels between the two of those uh, gentlemen, perhaps. Well, uh, uh, I tell you, uh, I, who turned me on to Sonny Denzel was was my good friend uh, Kevin Roberts at 
uh, assistant coach at Oregon State University. Uh, uh, Sonny was at Simon Fraser University up in up in Vancouver, and uh, and I'd wanna I'd gone out to uh, recruit Clayton Jack. Uh, uh, actually, Chad Hankey was who I was after at at the time, and uh, but Chad was was a junior, and uh, and. Clayton was out there, and Clayton had people who don't know Clayton and Clay Jack. Uh, he's six foot seven, six foot eight, you know, uh, 275, 85 pounds, and well, he's a uh, mountain man, monster mountain man. That's an intimidating looking guy, too. And so uh, Kevin and I was talking, and he said, Hey, there's this kid up at Simon Fraser University you should take a look at. And so uh, he told me who his name. He said that at the time, uh, Sonny was only 18 years old. So I went. I went up and talked to Sonny. And uh, Sonny, like I said, was 18. And he he had a day. Well, I wanted. You know, we want. We want. We want our guys to finish their education, whatever level it is, whatever they start. We want them to finish. So I told Sonny, go ahead and finish your. You get your get your associate's degree, and uh, and we'll talk. You know. And so. Uh, and so he did, and so uh, he, he came down, brought him down to camp at 19, but Sonny was on the junior world team at the time, and you're right, he was considered, uh, he probably could make the, the Canadian Olympic team, but he was on the junior world team, and uh, and so he came down to camp, and, you know, of course, blew everybody's mind, and we're looking for, for that type of character and I did some research come from a very fine family and so Sonny said hey I would really love the WWE my heart's heart's there but I'd really like to you know finish it well you made you made a team so go ahead I do think he went over and won the silver medal and then we, after he won the silver medal we sent him to India and he was uh, receptive to where I like the hero and uh, he just reported to us uh, 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 right at the end of uh, 2014, and uh, I was over there. Of course, I got asked to coach, and all my guys, and I was telling my go over there, and uh, he said, uh, "They said that Sonny's going to be great. Sonny's going to be really good." So he, he's a very intelligent young man, but uh, you know, he uh, we told him, you know, that he'd come to us at that because he's so young. At any time, if he wanted to wait, he said, "My heart's here." He said. This is what I want to do. So he, we, we went ahead and signed him. So I'm very happy with Sonny, and the coaches seem to be very happy with him. And I think we'll have a have an international star, you know, in the next few years in in Sonny. And there's a few more up in, in Vancouver area that that I'm looking at, thanks to uh, Kevin Roberts at Oregon State University. That, I get a lot of cooperation. It is, it's great. You know, I, now I, when I go around, I know so many coaches. Uh, Troy Nickerson that uh, just got the head coaching job at Northern Colorado. That uh, was an assistant coach uh, out of, under K, KJ, Kevin Jackson at Iowa State out in Las Vegas. said, Briscoe, you're really going to love my recruiting class I'm getting. He said, I got some really big boys for you. Said, oh, I love it when coaches come up and tell me that they're recruiting. <laughs> oh, God, they know I like, you know. So, But what what started that? The coaches, you know, when Brock was breaking in, uh, good old JR was doing the commentary. Of course, every time uh, Brock was on TV, you know, he's a product the University of Minnesota under the great coach, Jay Robinson. So, you know, we give the programs a lot of, lot of exposure by signing these guys also, which helps them in further recruiting. Yeah, it's it, you mentioned Kevin Roberts, and, you know, I, I don't know him, but I, I know uh, he's been a, a longtime friend of Chell's son and who's a, a friend of mine. So he's always talking about Kevin and uh, a huge, huge wrestling fan. I, I think he went to the WrestleMania last year. Yeah, I invited him down last year in New Orleans to, uh, to WrestleMania, and he, he had the time of his life. And, I mean, uh, everybody I meet is in Bristol, what are you not our boy, Kevin Roberts, man? He's, 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 but he grew up in, in outside of Spokane, Washington, and uh, he was always, you know, at, uh, at uh, that Northwest Wrestling promotion, Don Owen, to ran a promotion a lot like Eddie Graham down here in, in Florida where he had athletes there and they had athletes that could wrestle. So Kevin being a wrestler himself, you know, latched on to that and then at, at an early age became a, a, a pro uh, wrestling fan. And so, uh, 
So I I was at a Pac-12 tournament, and uh, and Kevin's not the biggest guy, but uh, he came up to me. He said, and then introduced himself, and I started talking to him, and uh, and became he now become one of my best friends and a reliable source of talent. Um, there was a young man that. Um, that got injured that I was looking with uh, Mike McClure out of, out of Michigan State, which we're, we're hoping to sign. He's uh, He was injured, so we weren't able to sign him yet, but uh, and he's coming back down in June, and I expect him to, to be signed right away. But uh, he, they were in the Reno at the Reno Open, and he's wrestling Chad Hankey with the time was the number one rated uh, heavyweight in the, in the country. Uh, Chad had a high single. Tom, you know what I'm talking about on on on, on uh, Mike and my. It's, this is on Flow Wrestling right now. The, the video of it and uh, 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 Mike. Posted his hand on uh, on uh, on uh, Chad's chest and did a one legged. Now you're in a single leg and you know you're hopping around trying to keep your balance. Posted his hand on on Chad's chest, did a standing one legged backflip, and had the state of mind after he completed the backflip to turn right into. Uh, to Chad and double leg him for a two point takedown. That's what it, the, the standing single uh, backflip didn't impress me as much as the keeping your train of thought when you land to turn and shoot for a double leg and score the two points. And then he had a beat on that move. I had three coaches coming that day and tell me about Briscoe, you got to see this guy. The next one's guys on the airplane to East Lansing, Michigan to check uh, McClure out. And McClure, it was right before the Big Ten tournament. McClure said, I can do a standing back, but I, you want to see it? And I said, Mike, if you do one and you happen to hurt yourself a week before the Big Ten, I'll be run out of, out of this gym and never invited back. So, no, I know you can do it, so save it for me. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. so uh, I, I rely on these coaches. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, when I have these coaches come up to me, hey, you'll really like the recruiting class. I got some guys you'll really like. That makes me feel good. It makes me think I'm doing my job and forming these relationships and trust with these coaches. And, and I really enjoy the, the, the young coaches because they grew up. Some of them try to hide the fact that they, um, they were closet, what we call closet wrestling fans, but sooner or later it comes out, hey, it was Hogan. what was Hogan really like? So you did watch, after all. You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, it, 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 it's a great resource, you know, to have these coaches on your side. And I try to attend as many dance during the off-season where they have a little bit more time, you know, like Beach the Street out in New York and my good friend Noel Thompson up in New York and that helps organize that, that great event that, that, uh, that's done in Beat the Streets New York and that, 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 that organization has expanded all over the United States to help these kids get off the inner city streets and onto a map and show them that they, they can do something with their lives. So I, I, I try to form those relationships the best I can. Yeah. So Noel, he, I, I think his day job, he works for Goldman Sachs or something. He's well, also, he's got his own, he's got his own hedge fund company now. Oh, right? okay. And he's, very bright young man. He's a ambassador to Jamaica. I mean, he's a guy, the guy's multi-talented. He, he, he's a great, great guy. Always, if you ever meet Noel, and know, uh, watch him, he, the guy, I don't know what it is. I wish I had that attitude that he He's always got a great smile on his face and, and just one of the nicest guys. And he came to ODW, our, one of our original training camps, for a camp when he, when he got out of, uh, out of college and, and it just didn't work out for him. And, but life has worked out good well for him because of the position he's in now. Hofstra, I think it might have been around Hofstra, the same yeah, time. Yeah, he was just yeah, he was just uh, inducted into the Hofstra Hall of Fame. You're right. It might I, have been. I, I don't know if Hofstra. Weidman was there around the same time. Chris Weidman, the the UFC uh, middleweight champion, because I think they're around the same age. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I yeah. think they are. But you know, it, it's funny. You mentioned Mike McClure. Uh, from Michigan State, I was uh, talking at. I, I talked uh, quite a bit with John Reeder, the former champion uh, from uh, Iowa State. Uh, I love John. What a great guy! Yeah, yeah and I, I really admire John. He's so intense. He's, he's just. I'm just like, oh, geez. I, I wish I could, you know, uh, channel some of the intensity that this guy has. You're right. You know, to to attack each day, but um, 
Yeah, he he was say, yeah that he was like yeah McClure he's tailor made to be uh, you know WWE superstar. Yeah, and I think John would be too. I love John to death. I think he's, he's what a gentleman he is, and uh, he was recruited by my friend Bobby Douglas, and uh, you know he's he's quality quality young man. So uh, I wish him the best of luck in his pursuit of Olympic uh, dream, and, and hope he makes it as as I do. You know a lot of those guys. Another guy I really like and I think would would be such a great superstar, but he 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 got other aspirations, but I'm going to go ahead and mention his name, it is Jake Hubert. Uh, what, what an athlete he is, and what a personality he is, and what creativity the guy has. I think he'd, he'd, he'd be such a such an asset to us and such a big star to us. But like I said, he's got other aspirations. I respect that. You know, guys that are honest with him, like, like Zach Ray uh, out, of, out of Kent State. I, or, or, or Lehigh, I'm sorry. I was really after him, and he said, Mr. Briscoe, I just don't think that's the right sport for me. I, I want to you know, pursue other opportunities. And I don't I don't harass them. I don't bother them. Not after that. You know, they're honest with me, honest enough to tell me what they, what they want to do, and I, and I respect that. One guy I haven't given up on yet is, is Tony Nelson, and I, I'm i persistent, and I think Tony's finding that out. And uh, he told me I'm I guess I still got your card right here in my pocket. And he said, I just, you know, at this time, I want to look at other places. You know, he's looking at the freestyle team also. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm an Olympic supporter. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of international wrestling. So, I'm just hoping that, that he does make it. And then when he does make it, he, 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 he keeps us in mind, you know. But there, there's a lot of them out there. And, you know, they're all polite. I have run into a couple of a-holes that I'm not going to mention any names, but, uh, uh, you know, yeah, hey, what do I have to take steroids? And I tell them, not unless you're going to play baseball. You don't take them with us, you know, with the drug testing. <laughs> uh, I probably have all the baseball players mad at me now, so that's all right. I can run faster than they can. We've done a uh, a lot of toe in the line back and forth between you know mixed martial arts and pro wrestling, and obviously um, your expertise kind of lies not only in the pro wrestling world, but with a lot of guys who have amateur wrestling background or guys who are known as you know legit shooters. Uh, is there anybody out there, Jerry, that perhaps we don't know, uh, or the the listeners out there don't know, who was a legit legit tough guy? Um, but maybe didn't have the, the notoriety as being a shooter, somebody that would surprise us? Uh, well, I mean, we all have our different descriptions of legitimate tough guys. Uh, uh, there are some guys out there. Uh, uh, Phil Brooks, uh, you know, Sam Punk. He's going to surprise a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy is trained in, in different varieties of, uh, mixed martial arts since he was, you know, preteen, and even during these years, I mean, he would he would go into a city and he'd find an MMA gym and he he would go and train. And I don't know, you and I had some conversations about some of the comments that was made by a, a certain friend of both of ours, <laughs> you know, that upset me a little bit. And now I uh, see where he's actually coaching uh, uh, Phil in in the in, in, in grappling, which I'm glad that they're doing, you know, because I think they can really learn from each other. But he's going to shock a lot of people, you know, when when he finally gets into that octagon. I think you might have been talking about the uh, the very shy young man that uh, lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that uh, wrestled in Missouri. The, the, he doesn't really like to tell people what he thinks about things. <laughs> no, he doesn't. And, you know, and that's what I mean. I think he and he and Bill can really learn from each other. And, and you know, if, if that guy is, is the bright guy that I think he is and we both know he is, he will learn from him because uh, – He's such a such a sponge when it comes to uh, to knowledge, but I don't mind people speaking their mind. But you know, you don't have to insult the world, you know, to to, to make your point. And uh, and I wish him nothing but luck, and I wish him. I hope he makes the big league soon. The big league, you know what I mean? By that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. The USC, yeah. the one where you make the money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, 
I, I am an incredibly huge mark for the Iron Sheik. I, there's just something about this guy that I think is hilarious. And a, a lot of people, maybe they don't see the humor. I mean, I've even had people say, like, what's so funny about it? You can't even understand him. I was like, that's part of it. So, Jerry, what is your best Iron Sheik story? Uh, he called me coach. Uh, I love, I love him because uh, I've known him uh, since he got into the business. Uh, Bern Gagne, uh, they hired him up in Minnesota to be a Greco coach. Uh, 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 the great Alan Rice, who uh, brought him over, uh, and he was he, he so legit, uh, uh, legit tough guy that uh, a lot of people just see the humor, but this guy was was a freak. I mean, an animal. And uh, I think it was what a correct me if I'm wrong, a silver medalist uh, uh, in Olympics, and uh, and was the uh, the sheets uh, the ruler over in and uh, in, in, in the country body personal bodyguard, and Alan Rice met him, and the U.S. Uh, need was in need of a Greco coach, and Alan paid his way over here and got him got him all settled out in uh, in Minnesota, and he was he coached at uh, Minnesota club uh, wrestling team up there in Greco, and uh, and then he hooked him up with Vern Gagne because he just had this outgoing personality, just a funny guy to be around, you know, and so uh, uh, he, uh, he uh, Vern broke him in and sent him down to Florida because down here in this territory we did a, a wrestling style, kind of a, a shoot work type wrestling style down here, so so Vern knew he had feeling good and that he'd really like him and, 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 and he did and then the, of course he went to New York uh, and became a superstar up there but there's so many stories about road trips with the Sheik um, you know they're all common you know that I'd be repetitive probably if, if, if I told one but uh, you know he, he liked the herbs <laughs> and so uh, the green medicine <laughs> as he calls it yeah <laughs> oh, and uh, he had to have it, and uh, you know, some autograph session, he reached in the wallet and you know, his stash fall out or something like that. But he's a hilarious guy, and he he he's everything that lets you read. I don't think any, I don't think he could exaggerate a story about the art and chic. I really don't. I think what you, what what you hear is true, and uh, but he's also a lovable guy that. If he's your friend, he's your friend for life. Uh, the, the story that I, that I always like to tell, he rubbed Andre the Giant the wrong way one night. <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and you don't want to rub that guy the wrong way, believe me. He hates and Andre the Giant. <laughs> Pardon? He hates Andre. He still cuts promos on him. Yeah, I know. He's still to this day. He does a lot of people. and uh, But uh, we were, uh, Andre, we were sitting in the dressing room. We had separate dressing rooms and, uh, back in the old days. And uh, Andre said, Briscoe, come out and watch this match. You're going to like it tonight. I looked at I didn't know who he was. I looked at the sheet and I saw the lineup. He tried to and she got man, this be interesting. <laughs> you know, so I went out and... He went, and Andre surprising had with with his speed when he was young. This guy, you know, as big as he was, he could be moving, of course, as powerful as as, as a semi truck. And so uh, he went behind Sheik, and he suplexed Sheik from one corner to another, and ran over. By the time Sheik got up, he was behind Sheik again, and suplexed him back to the other side. Sheik rolled out of the ring and just. The heck with this and got counted out. That wasn't even the finish of the match. You know? <laughs> so the next week we had a, a two man battle, a, a two ring battle royal. Sheik went, uh, Andre went right straight to Sheik as soon as he, uh, the bell rang, picked him up, body pressed him over his head, and in the middle of ring one, tossed him over the rope into the middle of ring two, just in a, in a blink of an eye. And well, Holy cow, he won't mess that big ball, you know. But uh, uh, she, she just rubbed him the wrong way for some reason. And, and, and Andre maybe paid the price every night. She was scared to death of him. I think that's the only guy she was ever afraid of. Uh, well, it seems like uh, Andre kind of ran afoul of a couple of guys who were, who were legit tough guys, uh, not only the Sheik there, but also, you know, he, he had some documented problems with Bad News Allen. 
uh, he's also known as Bad News Brown, uh, to yeah. someone who was who was a legit tough guy. I mean, I, I run into well, him. he was he was he was a medalist in Jiu-Jitsu, uh, Jiu-Jitsu yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. one of those. Yeah. Seventy six Olympics in uh, yeah. Montreal. He was a, he, he, I think he won silver, representing yeah. Canada, something like that. Well, I Andre really had to respect you, and and, and bad news had just went up in the wrong way. Andre was easy to rub the wrong way. I was made funny. He, I had a little a funny story on Andre. I had a little two seater Mercedes Benz, a little uh, four fifty SL. He loved to ride that car, and his head, of course, would stick. You know, all, I'd, I'd have to put the top down. And his head would stick on me at a big pro at the time. So one day I picked him up at the Atlanta airport, and we're going to Griffin, Georgia, like a 45-minute uh, trip to from Atlanta airport to, to the arena. And we're running late. As you I had to stop, I always stopped. And the reason he liked to ride with me, because I knew he liked that Matus wine. So I stopped and bought seven bottles, eight bottles of Matus wine. <laughs> I had one open, so as soon as he got in the car, I handed him uh, and the bottle of my two swine opened up and he goes it down. So we took off and we were running late and I was going probably a little too fast for the law and all of a sudden it's all the blue light behind me. So I pull over and I pull over. Andre was really leaning down and see because we we're going so fast, you know, he's kind of leaning down. But I had to put the top down, you know, so he could get in the damn car. And he loved, for some reason, he loved riding in that car and wanted me to pick him up all the time. So he had scoots down. But when that cop pulled over, Andre, you know, slid himself back up in the seat and straightened himself up. And of course, you know, it was a giant, you know. And as soon as that cop saw that, I saw her looking there as I was getting out of the car. And back in those days, I wanted you to get out of the car. And and so I saw that cop un- unbutton that that 357 on his on his hip there, and I hold it. Just tell what are we doing? You know, I was speeding. So I walked back, and he said, "Boy, you're you're kind of going a little faster." And I said, "Yeah, I got a Andre giant in the car there. We're trying to get over Griffin over here to make it make the show tonight." He said, well, you're going a little fast. He said, but I'll tell you what, is that really Andre and John? And I said, look at him. And he said, oh, yeah, it looks like it from there. And I said, he said, he's, he's all right. And I said, yeah, he's all right. But he had kept his hand on the gun and walked up to the side of the car. And, uh, hello, Mr. Andre. Hello, and Andre, uh, hello, boss. You know, and a cop looked at me. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. And Andre hated signing autographs and taking pictures. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll get his autograph for me, uh, I'll let you go. And just tell you to slow down. I said, You got to do so I walked up. I said, Andre, you got to help me here. I know you don't like to do it, but, you know, back in those days, you didn't have cell phones to take pictures with. I said, Would you sign, sign this sheet of paper for the cop and he'll let us go? And he said, Sure, boss. So he signed it. I took it toward the cop. Cop fainted. And he said, Okay, just slow down. I'm on radio. Guys in front of you, let them know that you're coming, so you better not be speeding or they'll go right you up. I said, okay. So he let me go, and we took off on that, on, on, the, on into Griffin there. But that cop was scared of that. He had his hand on his revolver the, the whole time we were, we were sitting there. Did Andre finish but, uh, all seven bottles? Before you made it to uh, the venue? Before he made it to the arena. You got that right. <laughs> and then on the way back, I'd buy two... Uh, Two cases of uh, Curve Light. Why he liked light beer after drinking all that wine, I don't know. But he, uh, you, you know, you don't spit in the wind, you don't turn on Superman's cake, and you always make sure Andre the Giant has a proper amount of beer, and you don't try to go beer for beer with Andre the Giant. I found that out too many times. <laughs> I've heard the same thing about Brian, actually, with his Coors Light. You don't want to go beer for beer with him either. Uh, yeah, is that right? Well, yeah. I didn't get to find that out, you know. <laughs> and and then you, you 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 mentioned the name earlier that you know would be would be kind of silly not to talk about it. It is a, it's a good buddy, Chell. If I would have met Chell, and I mean, you know, there's certain guys that just have it, you know. And Chell Sean is one of them. I mean, he's outspoken. He's, he's very intelligent. He's got all the ingredients, and I would have loved to found him when he was come out of Oregon. And so made him a WWE superstar because he grew up in like Kevin did and in the Pacific Northwest and was a huge fan of Don Orange's uh, promotion of wrestling. He's a historian. He, he he probably can tell you more stories than I can about 
professional wrestling. The guy, the guy's just phenomenal. I love him to death. I enjoy being around him. He puts up with my my BS with him because I I'm not shy. I, you know, I got a little uh, too many beers one night and. Uh, and uh in Vegas and when he was out there training I called him called him every name in the book to come out and get him a drink with me. He wouldn't do it, but, you know, and I was yeah. uh, the next morning I said, I I talked to Chell. How why did I call him? You gotta be kidding me. I was I was scared to death about a week he'd track me down and, and choke me out. <laughs> but he did. Yeah, you, you know, Jerry, he doesn't drink. I mean he he yeah. he'll inject <laughs> <laughs> He'll inject everything else in himself, but but no drinking. <laughs> you don't put anything bad in his body, is what you're saying. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the, you know, he draws. Well, at line. least he admits it now. At least, at least he'll admit it now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and he, you know, and I think through your prompting, me and him had a uh, had a had a had a had a conversation this last time, and uh, and you know how to handle the situation, and I think finally. Between me and Jim Ross, who now has become, you know, good friends with him, uh, you know, through through my introduction uh, with Jill and then Jr. and uh, and uh, and Jr. is a very bright man, and uh, Jr. This is how you have to go and tell the truth, man. The world loves somebody to tell the truth, you know. I'm not don't deny nothing, you know. So Bill, in his own unique way, went in and did the dirty deed that he had to do, you know. Yeah, the right thing. I say. Yeah, you know it. It's the only thing that that he could have done, and you know he's uh, he's at ESPN now. He has a deal uh, for every pay per view. They bring him on Sports Center, and they do a little spot with him. Uh, it, you know, it's thirteen times a year. It, it's all the way in Connecticut. Um, you know, I, I I don't know if if Foxes will bring him will bring him back. You know, I hope they do because I, I know he loved that job. But um, well, and, uh, and we also know there's there's whatever he chooses to do, he'll 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 find a way to get it done. And and you know, I mean, you know, you, you I think I think the world forgiving if you're honest, and and, and you, yeah. he, he he was honest for that occasion. And uh, I have respect. I I went. Uh, he picked me up one time in Portland, took me down to. Uh, to Corvallis uh, to uh, to the Pac-12 tournament, and I spent the weekend, you know, just BSing back and forth with him and uh, trading no war stories. And I just really enjoyed being around the guy, and he's so entertaining. And then uh, he's a, he's another guy. I, uh, you know, he'd reach that age. And I said, you know, so you just you know. You know, you 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 pass that point there, and uh, you know you see guys like Chell and, and you know I, you see kid Ben all the time. Now he's making big guys. Ben, if you were uh, fifty pounds heavier, a little bit taller, and I told the same thing to Johnny uh, Henderson. Uh, you know, I told him I said, "Man, I wish you were a little bit bigger. I I could make you guys so damn much money, you know." But now they're making making the money that that they deserve to make, but. Uh, you, the, the, when you when you and 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 collegiate wrestling, when you get a response where it's boo or a yay, it's a response, and it's something that our our sport needs. And have two gigantic personalities like Johnny Henderson and, and, and Ben Asher come along at the same time. Wrestling was was just huge, and and you go into these arenas and see these guys and hear the response, and holy cow, you don't you only hear that pro sports, you know, you didn't hear it in, in wrestling, but when those two guys hit the mat, it was going to be one or the other, and that was exciting for the sport, and, and great for the sport, I thought. Absolutely, I mean, the Hendricks Askren, uh, I hope it happens in MMA, I mean, I know they, they wrestled as high school kids, and then they were supposed to wrestle again at the All-Star Classic, and I think Ben was willing to come down to 65. Yep. And somehow it just didn't happen. It didn't happen, yeah. And there's several conspiracy theories on that, too, you know. But, uh, of course, I'm a cowboy, so I'm going to take my cowboy side. <laughs> right on cowboys. No, hey, Tom, I, I don't know. Have you heard – I don't know – the legitimacy of this story because anything with Hulk Hogan you really have to check <laughs> two three times and then like check it through another ten people yeah. but uh, the story that I heard 
Jerry, was you were at a nightclub, I guess sometime in the 70s. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> and you saw this six foot seven, 300 pound guy jacked out of his mind, bodybuilder named Terry Balea. And you said, hey, would you like to go to the snake pit and train with Hiro Matsuda? Is that kind of the what happened, or is, is that just folklore? That, that's about as close to the truth as, as anybody will admit. Uh, we went in, my brother and I, my brother was there too, and we went into this club right, right outside of the University of South Florida, you know. And um, we happened to know the lady serving drinks who was Terry's next door neighbor. And, uh, and uh, of course, you know, wrestling was, was big in Tampa, where they weren't any franchises down there, so we were we were the action here in Tampa. You know, if you want to be entertained, that's that's where you went was to the United the Army. So, well, I noticed Terry sitting out in the audience a couple of times. He never, you know, had a, a really great seat because he didn't have a lot of money, and so he's always sit towards the back and then see it, big guy. But he just sat there, no reaction or anything like that, and and, and didn't, I didn't think anything about it, but. Uh, one night we went into this uh, establishment, and uh, up on the stage was 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 this huge guy playing the bass guitar. And I asked the young lady, I said, "Do you know who that is?" Yeah, it's Terry Bollea. I said, "Man, I'd like to talk to him about being a wrestler." She said, "Well, oh, he he found he'd, he'd he'd love to talk to you." I said, "Well, the next break, have him come down." So next break, he came down. We went to back and uh, sat there and talked. <laughs> We come out and down in, uh, in the morning, and um, Hero Matsu will be down there, and we'll put you in the ring. With, he's, he has better keep you kidding. I get to go in the ring with Hero Matsu. Sure. So the next morning, 9 o'clock, he was there. And Matsu to win in. Matsu is one of these punisher guys that uh, he liked to hurt people. So, he, you know, you test people, see if they want to really do it, or if they, you know, I've never heard, I've seen cops, I've seen bodybuilders, I've seen everything run out of that sportatorium there uh, here in Tampa, you know, after after uh, Hero gets a hold of him. But uh, he got a hold of Terry, a big muscular guy, and grabbed a, an ankle lock on him. And 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 the, and the story is he broke his leg, but he didn't break his leg. He just severely sprained his ankle. And the next we figured, and Terry limped out of there, and we figured, well, that's the end of him. And the next morning, he was there again with his uh, ankle taped up, his tie probably too tight, and his shoes laced, laced up. And he said, I'm ready to go again. And we took a look, and it was so black and, and bruised up and blue. We said, Terry, take a week and come back next week, and we'll trade him. He was back the next week and back the next day, back the next day, and pretty soon, you know, the rest is history. But that's that's the story of Hulk Hogan. <clears throat> and we, we had him here in Tampa and uh, trying to book him. And, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of large guys down here. So I called, uh, called uh, and he was, wasn't getting many bookings and making a living. So, and his mom, his mom was, didn't want him in the business at all. So I would call his house. He was living at home. Tell his mom he you're booked. Uh, tell Terry he's booked in uh, Fort Myers. Just say Fort Myers tonight. Be there at six thirty. You know, and he's got a match. Well, she wouldn't tell him because she didn't want him to be in the business. So after a while, I figured out. You know, Terry, I don't mind going. I said, Terry, I called your house three times. Dude. Well, my mom don't want him in the business, and so she's not telling me who's calling. So it ended up I started calling his next door neighbor, that young lady, and then telling her, "Would you make sure Terry knows he's booked in Barrow?" Beach tomorrow night. We need him at six thirty. So she started delivering the messages to him, and so, but he wasn't getting any bookings. So I knew in the back of my mind the place for him was New York, but you know he wasn't ready to go. So you know I said, well, I'm a uh, Jerry Lawler is a good friend of mine. Uh, no relation, right, Tom? <laughs> no, no. Unfortunately, yeah. not. <laughs> well, anyway, Jerry's a good friend of mine, so I called Jerry and said, Jerry, I got this huge guy for you. So he said, send him up. So he went up there, and I told Terry, I said, when when you think you're ready, and you'll know when you think you're ready, uh, come back, and we'll call Ben Sr., and we'll get your book in New York. 
So about uh, a year, less than a year later, he came knocking on my door here, down here in Odessa, and then, and I went in, and it was Terry and, uh, and Ed Leslie, British Barber Beefcake, which I think. So he came in, and I pulled the table in the floor with him, and we played a couple of games. He finally got around with Doug Speed Bears, and uh, said, I'm ready to go to New York. And so, said, okay, so they took the phone, called Dan Senior, and said, Vince, you've got this giant here for you. He's, he's so big, you'll be impressed with him, because, you know, that was a big man place. And, and, uh, and so um, he said, well, tell me a little bit. So I told him a little bit about him. He said, when can he start? I said, when do you want him? He said, I have him up here in, in a couple of weeks. So two weeks went by and we sent him, sent him to New York. The story is Jack bought him a pair of wrestling boots, and I gave him a $100 bill because he had no money or boots. So Jack, my brother Jack, bought him the boots, and I gave him a $100 bill, which, by the way, he did pay me back. <laughs> And uh, so uh, we sent him up there, and uh, he won a wrestling in the garden. And so back then, everybody wore, you know, big Ric Flair robes, which cost a fortune, you know, and he didn't have money. So he was wearing a T-shirt and ring. So it's a, it's a all his tailor, had his tailor, personal tailor come, made Terry a, a jacket, a robe. Yeah, the first robe that Terry ever had, and worked worked to the ring, and uh, and then then fell in love with him. He had a had a little run there, and uh, back in those days, you know, he kind of rotated town uh, a lot, and uh, and so his next stop was uh, was uh, Minnesota. Went out there for Vern and made a bundle out there, and uh, that's when Vince Jr. took over, and uh, and uh, Vince always liked Terry. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Vince Nina called there and, you know, made a deal with him to leave Vern and come back to the WWE in New York. And they told him, you know, what the plans were to, to build the empire that he built. And, of course, Terry and, and Vince uh, got along great together and they worked together and ended up building a dynasty. Yep. Uh, Jerry just says, a, uh, as a little thing before we go, and I know I can speak for Brian. Uh, I assume I can in this case, and just saying that it's been a pleasure to have you on, um, especially with all the, the past knowledge that you have of pro wrestling, uh, and especially how that can help translate into uh, not only mixed martial arts today, currently, but the sport of amateur wrestling and helping that get off the ground. Uh, you know, I just want to say personally thank you for uh, keeping you know the sport of amateur wrestling in your mind and helping promote that. Um, you know, throughout professional wrestling and, you know, just throughout the sports world in general. But uh, before you go, I'd like to talk about one thing that we haven't touched on, and that is what I perceive to be the biggest double cross in pro wrestling history, and that was uh, Pat Patterson uh, stealing the WWF heart. That low, that egg suck dog, Pat Patterson. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. It's Nashville, Tennessee. I saw that on I YouTube did, last night. <laughs> and I beat on a weight crash over at Holly this time. First time I met, you know, he might have had a little too much of drink and passed out, and I, I bribed the, uh, the APA, uh, Ron Simmons and John Layfield, and they left the room with, uh, with a little guy that was a singer with Kid Rock and um, went out to an adult establishment and had some adult beverages. So I, you know, the hardcore title was defended 24-7. <laughs> so, uh, so I would step outside the door and I saw a referee come in here. And, uh, and I put my finger on crash off it, beat him one, two, three, and the referee, being a clumsy guy that he was, stumbled, woke crash up, crash chased me into the ring and back him out and that was safe. So we went around and, you know, we ended up with John Schaap one night in, uh, in, uh, in New York. And, uh, and, uh, he was, uh, Schaap had come down to find, I found out he was hard by crash to try to help find me. And, uh, and uh, we just happened to stumble into him and, and another adult is there, but uh, chased around New York a little bit, so I had to defend the title in Nashville, and so uh, I beat Crash that night, came back, and we were celebrating with champagne, and I thought Pat was my friend, I thought Pat was my buddy, he was my, my, <laughs> what had my back all the time, what, all he was looking at was to get that thing, so we had two bottles of champagne, and I 
turned up mine, you know, drinking it down all of a sudden. He hit me over the head, knocked me out. You're right. It was probably the biggest conspiracy, the biggest screw job ever in the history of wrestling. And uh, at a referee there, I went down, you know, I was blinded and knocked out by a champagne bottle. And Pat stole the title from me. And, uh, and then we ended up in some goofy match in Boston, Massachusetts, you know, that I wasn't too fond of, but Pat didn't mind that wrestling drag. But I didn't, I didn't like to do well. My kids didn't like to do well. And Crash came out and interfered that and won the title back, and that was the end of Pat and I's feud. And we, but uh, it Pat, was quite an experience. It was a fun time. Was that Mike Chioda that double crossed you on that? I think it was Chioda. Yeah, and he's a double crosser anyway. You gotta watch, you watch your back when you're around him. <laughs> As a viewer, I mean, I, I just have to say that watching uh, back during that time, especially with the, I mean, I was a huge fan of the 24 7 rules with the hardcore title, but, uh, Really, you expose yourself to a new a new group of people and a new uh, audience there with your your work as um, you know, for lack of better words, Vince McMahon stooge, and uh, you know it's really it's really awesome to see somebody adapt um, to the pro wrestling world and and be somebody that was so such a legitimate uh, tough wrestler in their day and be able to go out there and work some comedy. It's really uh, you know it's refreshing in a way. Well, thank you, Tom. And, you know, it was a blast. And, and, and I kid Patterson about it all the time. And he gets a little upset. I said, Pat, you and I worked all of our careers to build a legitimate type uh, career. And Pat was considered one of the greatest performer workers of all time, you know, from the San Francisco days with Ray Stevens to Minneapolis days up in, in the AWA. And then, of course, the, the world's first intercontinental champion that he won in Rio de Janeiro. I forgot who the opponent was, but anyway, he, he won, the, won the title down there. So uh, we'd worked, I said, we worked all of our careers to, you know, to to have a legitimate career and be respected as, as top performers of, uh, of our time and of, of, of the business in general, the industry in general. I said, now we're going to be tied together as two bumbling, stumbling old stooges for Vince McMahon. And, you know, but, but the great thing about it, it did introduce us to an entirely different group of, uh, of fans and a different generation of fans. So uh, it, it helped just perpetuate, I think, our, our, uh, our style. And you're right, Tom. I mean, we, we were completely different and it was the entertainment, attitude entertainment there. And, and I, we both, you know, accepted it and ran with the ball and drum on give me the ball and I'll run with it, you know. And I think we gained so much respect from that generation's talent that it was unbelievable. That night, uh, you might recall too, that when we wrestled Mean Street Posse and and I think it was Orlando and defeated them. And we came out with all cold and music. Remember that? And we did the posing and all that stuff. <laughs> it generated the highest rating of Raw of all time, like an 8.6, which was phenomenal. You know, it's like 12, 12, 13 million people. Highest, the highest rated uh, segment of Raw of all time. Now, I think Rock, rock and uh, it took Rock and Mick Foley to break it with the... Uh, the birthday party. This is your live party that Nick mm-hmm. Foley threw the rock one night. That was the only day there. But as far as an action segment, we we still hold the highest highest rating of all time. I wish I don't think it'll ever be broken. But it was a great time, a great time during my career. I really enjoyed it. It was coming home. I you know, both of my boys were young and in school at the time, and coming home and, and trying to explain to them what dad had done <laughs> the night before, you know, was was always a challenge, you know, and, uh, and I was a volunteer high school wrestling coach, and uh, and uh, my kids at, 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 and, at, on my team just loved it, you know, because they were coached by, you know, Vince McMahon Stude, and we'd walk into their gymnasiums, and of course, they they just, the response that, that I would get would just 
just knock you out the law. It, 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 and the other teen kids, you know, it, they'd all come over, shake hands with me. It was great, and I, but I, I loved it. It was great. And I was just thankful for the opportunity. And when you, you know it's yourself, Tom, when you're handed that ball and you get an opportunity, you, 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 if, you're, if you're halfway smart at all, you take advantage of it. And it was a, I was handed the ball, and we ran with it, and we scored every time. Well, so you had to you had to tell your kids, hey, you know, we we did this match with with Patterson, but you know, your dad's a badass, right? You know, <laughs> did you? Have well, to I think they knew I was a badass. <laughs> <laughs> And plus, when I uh, was their volunteer uh, coach, or when I get in the wrestling ring, they knew I knew what I was talking about. You know. Sure. Sure. Hey. They got kicked out of it. And, uh, you know, my business partner, hey, they, 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 you know, they hated when I wore that Bristol Brothers body shop t shirt. I loved it because I sold the hell out of those shirts. But, <laughs> you know, I had a telephone number of the shop on it. It was a legit telephone number. So everybody would be calling that number the next day, either chewing us out or laughing at us or, you know, wanting to, hey, is he there? You know, the Yankee, uh, the Yankee uh, spring training, uh, uh, facility Sean Benner Field is just just down the street from the shop. And so in in the springtime we'd have people driving down to the shop, just parking in front and getting out of the car, taking pictures. Some of them be bold enough to come inside, ask for, you know, a notepad or a pen or something like that. And we always obliged them. We'd always had uh, novelty like ink shop ink pens and notepads and stuff like that. We would sign and give to them and uh, let them take their pictures outside in front of the sign and everything. It was it was I like to say probably the most famous uh, auto body shop in, in the world, you know, for a period of years. Yeah, I, I I know the Briscoe Body Shop better than the ones that I know in my own hometown here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, hey, Jerry, I mean, thanks for taking being so generous with your time. I mean, it, it, you need to write a book or something, or or get your own podcast. It all this knowledge that you built up okay. uh, over the years uh, of being in this business and your unique insights into amateur wrestling, mixed martial arts, and then, of course, professional wrestling is really, uh, uh, like, unmatched. I mean, uh, there's not too many guys that would have your level of experience in all of those. Well, uh, Tom and Brian, I really appreciate it. It's, it's an honor for me, and I, I've been approached several times, but I'm just not ready to, to sit down and put it all on paper yet. And, but there will be one coming. I've had several nice offers, you know, to to, to do it. But uh, it's a commitment that I want to uh, do, and I want to do it right, and I, I want to I want to have it entertaining. And uh, I, I'm such a huge fan, and I'm, like I said, uh, when we started this, Tom, I'm, I've been a fan of years, and I appreciate what you guys do. I appreciate it. I appreciate action sports. I appreciate uh, the UFC, the Air Form, the MMA. I have a high, high respect for all of you guys, and uh, and I have a, I watch every form of wrestling. I don't care Lucha Libre or, or whatever organization it is. I watch it. I'm always scouting. I'm I. I the private ten, I I kid the kid the guys that flow wrestling and my good good friend Scott Casper at Take Down Radio uh, that I probably attend more events or amateur wrestling events than anybody in the country and and, and I'll put I'll put my schedule up against anybody in the country all on on uh Brian, as you know you, you you and I follow each other on Twitter at F G Briscoe, you know, and uh and from O'Brien uh, from O'Brien uh, and uh, I uh I'm always, you know, tweeting I'm, I'm here and I, the, the hospitality, I was at the multinational duels in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I've lived in Florida for so long, I'm a Florida boy, but I was up there as Tim Belosi, I, I told my wife, I said, I guess I'm a thermometer double here in Fort Wayne, it went from minus six to plus six, you know, from the time I got into the rain and got out, my, my thermometer on my car doubled. I was freezing, but the National Wrestling Coaches Association. I want to give props to them. I want to give props to the NCAA wrestling and every 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 high school, uh, every 
youth wrestling league wrestling coach, ever middle school wrestling coach and wrestler, ever high school wrestling coach and wrestler, ever collegiate, no matter what division you are, chase that dream. Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do something because if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Yeah, that's a great message. So I just wanted to reiterate Briscoe Body Shop in Tampa. Google that. And to buy, there's a great book. It's just entitled Briscoe. It's by uh, Crowbar Press. So if you just put that into Google. William Murdoch, you know, I've told it, Jack told it uh, personally to William Murdoch, a good dear friend of ours out of Asheville, North Carolina. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's by Crowbar Press. And uh, just Google that. Um, I bought the book myself, which is why I, I sounded uh, somewhat intelligent about the, the history. Uh, in some of this interview but uh, excellent book uh, so uh, you can get that about uh, the legendary Jack Briscoe and then also uh, of course Briscoe Body Shop is in Tampa and um, NXT you go to GeraldBriscoe.com too and by the way get those shirts and you know looking at information and I think if I could I'd like to give a, a Mick Poli shameless plug to something that I'm involved in uh, uh, you know, as you retire, you, you, you start volunteering, but sometimes you, you volunteer so much that that's all you're doing is volunteering. But I've, I'm, I'm involved in, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, Bill Murdoch, William Murdoch, that wrote Jack's book. He's president of Evelyn Charity, one of the largest 501c uh, organizations in the entire United States. And we, we have this headlock on hunger, and we like to say wrestlers go hungry by choice because we've got to make weight. But there's me the kids in every neighborhood, every city, no matter where you live, they go hungry, and it's not by choice. It's because they don't have the, the means and the funds to get food. And we're in cooperation with the Southern Athletic Conference at the at the Southern Conference uh, Wrestling Tournament coming up in, in Asheville, North Carolina. Soon we're in. You can go to. Um, to Headlock on Hunger on Twitter and on Facebook and make a donation. And 100% of the uh, funds go directly to the organization. We, we are working with a food bank and now at the a Southern Conference Wrestling Tournament. You buy a can of food, you get a discount on your t- ticket, and, uh, and plus you're helping needy children around the United States uh, get something to eat, put, put, put in their bodies and help their nutrition and help their school work because if you're hungry, you can't think, and uh, and we we don't want to see any kid go hungry in this country. So please help. Go to those uh, those uh, two social media sites I told you about, and uh, and please, anybody listening to this, please get out and, and help help headlock on hunger. There's going to be a hoops on hunger starting by Brad Darty soon. That, that that's taking our idea and taking it to uh, to. Um, to uh, basketball, and also you know, I think NASCAR is going to pick it up. So it's something I hope every organization, every sport picks up and helps these kids nationwide get, get some good food in their belly. Now, that's Brad Doherty of the University of North Carolina fame and Cleveland Cavaliers? It sure is, yes. That's him. Okay. Yeah, they, now he's a NASCAR analyst. Yeah. Now, yeah, you got it, yeah. Yeah, that's where really NASCAR started probably getting involved because Brad wasn't getting involved, and he, he started the hoops on hunger himself, and more. and Bill and I started the the headlock on hunger for the wrestling end of it. So we hope we hope this year this is a pilot program with the Southern Conference and Leroy Smith, the director of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, is heavily involved in it. As is Jim Ross, who's our national chairman. So it's it's going to grow, and we we hope. But in the next few years, it's in every wrestling conference in uh, every school in the United States. So push us luck and help us out, you know. Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds like a great initiative. And uh, just want to, uh, Tom, if you have any last thoughts uh, before, uh, you know, Jerry jumps off here. He's been so generous with his time, and uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah. No, it's been a uh, been a pleasure of mine uh, listening to you guys uh, go over these stories. And uh, as always, it's it's been great to hear Jerry and his perspective on things. And just want to say I'm a big fan, but not of yours, Brian, but of Jerry. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any fans. <laughs> oh, who is? I mean, <laughs> I know his Twitter fans are. <laughs> I, I think they follow me, even though they don't like me. They just want to know what I say. You know, it's not like they like me. They follow people like Tom and you because they actually like you. 
<laughs> well, one of these days I'll get that free brew, that adult beverage coming out somewhere down the line. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm good for it. I, I, I'm known to... Uh, I think, to, yeah. to well, the, the Worlds are out in Vegas this summer, or September, I think it is. And the yeah. first time we've hosted the World Tournament. So I, I, w- I was going to ask I'll you. I'll plan on it then, yeah. I was going to ask you, Jerry. Are, are you going to go to um, to the World Cup or the uh, the the U.S. Open? Uh, I think the, the World Cup is April twelfth, and the, the Open is like May sixth. And I'm, I'm I'm going to be at both. I'll probably be at the Open. I'm not sure about the Cup. I think there's a, still the amateur racing tournaments there or national tournaments going on during that time. That's out in where L. A. Yeah, it's in L. A. I, I I went last year. It was at the uh, the Forum. Yeah, and those people do a wonderful job out there. I'm, I'm so glad. I just wish wrestling was uh, had some universities in in California and in Florida where kids could continue their their careers. You know, maybe one day, you know, there's so much money out to USC and UCLA, you know, that the, they'll see fit to uh, to to bring the program back there. So because California's got a tremendous high school wrestling program, a lot of got a lot of great talent coming from out there. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point because I mean, what what universities you know sponsor wrestling in California? I mean, Stanford for yeah. sure, but I mean, it's impossible to get into Stanford, right? Cal State Fullerton uh, killed their program. Yeah. Is Northridge yeah. back? Well, they they still got uh, the St. Louis Obisco and uh, and Bakersfield uh, and our Bakersfield drama out there, but uh, there's a couple of out there that, you know that are full members of wrestling only in the Pac-12. You know that attend the Pac-12 tournament. So still, there's just been great term, uh, great talent out there. So. Come on, California. Come on, Florida. Come on, states. You know that's the reason. I, you know I'm not a big Ten fan, and uh, and I wasn't an Oregon fan because all the money Phil Knight. Phil Knight probably spent more money on one. And I know we're one that could wrap this up, but I got to get my thinning out here. <laughs> Oregon ahead. probably spent more money. Phil Knight probably spent more money on one set of, of uniforms than the entire wrestling program would take an entire year. So let loose some of that money, Phil Knight. I'm not going to buy any more Nikes or plug Nikes anymore. You know, let go of some of that money and get that wrestling program back. Oregon's a great state for wrestling. Look, look at the greats that come out of, out of Oregon. You know, some of the greatest ever. And as you know, Brian, I'm always plugging a young man from Southern Oregon, uh, uh, Brock. That's just, it's just one outstanding wrestler. Well, he's a no when I tell him. You know, I wish you were. I told him last week at the Monkey National Bulls, and I wish you were a little bigger because of your personality and your talent. You know, you 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 would make it. You know, he's, yeah, he's he's a really good kid. This uh, Daryl Christian is a, is a, a former Greco national champion. You know, I was a teammate of Chales at University of Oregon. And I became come friends with him, and he's kind of like a, a mentor to Brock. And he, he just says sure. that you know he's just Brock complete is. badass, and you know he is. He's intimidating when he walks on the mat, and amateur wrestling. When you find somebody that's intimidating when walking on the mat, you got the match won already, and you know, and he he hammers these guys. I love, you know, I, I mainly go to watch the big guy, but when he goes on the mat, I always go over and find the mat he's on, and uh, I, I I I walked up, I introduced myself to him uh, this time, and he said, you know, I really appreciate the plugs you give me on Twitter, and he said that he said I appreciate it, and, uh, and you know, I. A great little conversation with him, and um, and he mentioned your name. He said, oh, "Brian guy's a character," and I said, "Yeah, he's a big fan of yours." <laughs> so, uh, so you're getting on out there too. So yeah. keep it up, guys. I really enjoy this, and uh, keep up the great work. And uh, FG Briscoe on Twitter, and uh, let's knock them out, and let's go Cowboys win another win that thirty five drive for thirty five. Right. So. Uh, Hey, Good Jerry. luck all the amateur wrestlers out there and all, all the aspiring MMA and uh, uh, professional wrestling uh, young men. You know where to find me. If you can't find me, you can find Front Row Brian at, on Twitter at Front Row Brian and, uh, and tell him you're interested and, and he'll get the message to me. Now you see, you and I have worked a couple of deals uh, through direct uh, messaging. For, for our buddy Chell, and we can work some deals for some of these kids looking for a career, right? Absolutely. Yeah, more than happy to help. Thanks again, Jerry, for your time, and uh, thanks again uh, for my co host, uh, Filthy Tom Lawler. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, thanks a lot. Have a good evening. All right, take care.